Hi, this is Jerry Holton, and welcome to uh, our panel on uh, the role of story, narrative, novels in shaping uh, values, culture, leadership. Uh, we have a really great panel to discuss that with three quite different people uh, with uh, impressive careers, three distinct fields. First, a friend of mine from my days as Undersecretary of the Navy, Admiral Jim Stavridis, uh, former head of NATO, uh, now uh, former dean at Fletcher School, uh, and now in the investment banking world with a novel out we're going to talk about. Uh, Karen Paik, uh, great career with Pixar, helping Pixar make uh, some of the fantastic movies they had, 24 great animations, and now a uh, freelancing, helping build a new project. Uh, Again, involved with story and film. And finally, Angus Fletcher, uh, here with me in Columbus, Ohio, uh, and uh, a scientist of story, but also a neuroscientist. So uh, he combines the, how the brain works with uh, the more uh, call it soft side of where that leads to. So uh, with that, uh, I wanted to just pose a question to each of the panel to get things going and then... Uh, we're going to um, have a discussion. So um, first, uh, to the Admiral, Jim Sabaritas. Uh, you know, I sailed the same uh, South China Sea that you write about uh, as a young naval officer in those very islands. Uh, and uh, out of that, you write, because of your experiences there, you write a book, a novel, 2034, uh, a novel of the next world war. Uh, so I'm curious, you've written a lot of books on leadership, really well received too. Uh, the Accidental Admirals, Sailing True North, Command C. Uh, so I'm curious why a novel, especially one in which uh, China devastates the US Navy, and India plays the good guy. Uh, were you able to do something in that novel that you thought you could do in an op-ed or a testimony to Congress? Uh, what, what drove you to the novel and What's been the impact? I uh, came to write a novel about the future. The novel's 2034, a novel of the next world war, obviously set in 2034. I wrote a novel about the future because I was looking at the past. What I mean by that is I was looking at uh, Cold War literature. So think Dr. Strangelove, The Bedford Incident, Failsafe. Uh, Red Storm Rising, Sir John Hackett's The Third World War, Neville Shoot on the Beach, very rich literature of the Cold War. And I think part of why we never ended up in an actual war, why the war stayed cold, if you will, is because through the power of imagination, we could see how terrible it would be, how devastating it would be, how catastrophic it would be a world-changing slant ending it would be. So then spin to the present, you look at, unfortunately, we're, in my view, kind of stumbling into a Cold War with China over a variety of issues. But there's no rich body of literature in place to warn us to create a cautionary tale. And, and by the way, 2034, a novel of the next world war, is not Tom Clancy style writing. It's not good guys fight the bad guys and the good guys win in the end. The villain here is war. And it's a story of two nations sleepwalking into a war, which I think would be unfortunately all too easy to actually occur. You know, have you read Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman? And if we do that, it's going to be devastating. And uh, no one is gonna be around to really pick up the pieces and both nations will be at a minimum, sadly diminished. So that was the theory of the case. And has it been well received? Yeah, it, it hit number six on the New York Times bestseller list, uh, number nine on the uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And I'm smiling, Karen. Um, of the hitting number nine in that book was because we, we were behind three Dr. Seuss books. Uh, you'll recall that this is the <laughs> It was that week. <laughs> yeah, this is when the, the whole right wing in the country is buying Dr. Seuss books. 
uh, New York Times breaks out children's books, fortunately, for 2034. Uh, in any event, the book's been out 90 days. It's in its fourth printing. We've contracted with 16 different countries for overseas publication rights and non-English languages, uh, including many in Asia. So, yeah, I think it's getting out there. I'll close on the impact side by saying someone asked me the other day, I thought it was a good question, if you could force one person in the world to read your book, yeah. who would it be? And my answer was Xi Jinping, yeah. because if I could just get a picture of him holding the book, I could sell 400 million copies in China the next day. Yeah, that's right. Mandatory reading. That would be, that would be good. So is there a film in the future of this book? Um, well, we just signed a two book contract for sequels. So, this one is 2034. The next one will be 2054, which will focus on artificial intelligence and its impact mid-century. This is Ray Kurzweil. The singularity is near. It'll be here by mid-century if it's actually not here already. We're pretty close. And then 2074, the final book in what will be a trilogy following the surviving characters deep into the century is about climate and the impact of climate. So you tee up with U.S., China, potential war, move to artificial intelligence, man versus machine, man with machine, we'll see. And then climate, which I think is the real looming tower out there in so many ways. Yep. Well, it, it, I was listening to panels this morning, and those topics are dominating the discussion. Uh, the one that wasn't dominating actually was war. Uh, lots of discussion of climate, lots of discussion of the future of work, automation. Uh, Can I make I a point on that, by the way? Okay. Um, if you were doing this panel in January, no, let's do it in the fall. Um, actually, let's do it this month. So let's do it in, uh, in June of 1913. If we were having this panel, no one would be talking about war. Everyone would be talking about our intertwined economies and we're never going to go to war. And, you know, war is so 19th century. How'd that turn out? Yep. No, I, I, I just finished the uh, series by uh, Margaret's going to escape me on the peace. The first, the walk up to 2014 and the war and then the peace afterwards. A pretty tragic time uh, for the same reasons you're describing. So, Karen... I want to explore a little bit uh, how you take, let's say, a book like The Admiral's Written, and you walk it up to a, a, a film that really has this sort of cultural impact. Uh, Pixar does a pretty good job of that. You were part of that team for a long time. Uh, and I'm intrigued. They, they, you know, these films have worked at two levels, in my experience, often especially when they're aimed at children, there is that whole children's story with a lot of moral impact, but there's an adult version, which is kind of sly and nuanced and uh, it's making its impact. Uh, how much thought goes into that? Is that a sort of a, is there a science of uh, telling stories and do you use it? <laughs> Am I going to put you in a corner here, Angus? <laughs> um I would say that if you were to talk to, if you'd get like 50 filmmakers in a room, they would say that there, it is a craft. There are skills to, that are important to develop. Um, but really every time you make a movie, you are starting from scratch again. And I think that has to do with the particular nature of story where it's one of the few fields where you can have a part that works really well and yet has no use whatsoever to you on the project if it doesn't work well with everything else and if it doesn't make the whole story go. So, I mean, at Pixar alone, there have been, um, there have been projects that were scratched. There have been characters that were scratched. There have been plot lines that were scratched, locations that were scratched. And none of this is because um, they weren't worthy story elements in and of themselves or even fascinating ones, but if they don't all move together, then nothing works. So you have to let it go. And so the answer to any one piece of a story of does this work is it depends. Um, 
So Hitchcock had a line, right, that says the part of the proof of a uh, film producer and a, a director is what ends up on the cutting room floor. So it sounded like Fairmont ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, but is it, let's get to it, is it films, it's, there are a lot of films that are touted as though they're going to really take off and they don't. And then there's others that sort of almost dominate uh, the culture. Uh, it appears from an outsider's view that it looks like it's random. Uh, but from your view inside, do you, is there something going on really brilliant in the films that capture America or capture the world? I think that films, like any human endeavor, are subject to a lot of um, visible and invisible currents. And whether something is successful um, does rely on the quality of the film the quality of the idea, the quality of execution, but it also, whether it sort of catches the, catches the society's imagination, where, whether it's remembered past its time. I'm sure that um, all of you on this panel know of people or projects who you felt were extremely worthy and should have met with greater success than they did because the timing wasn't right, or there was just some, I mean, I think that that's something that happens in uh, the Admiral's book, he is talking about characters who have, who are incredibly skilled, incredibly prepared, incredibly good at what they do, people who have the best intentions, and some butterfly flaps its wings, and you find yourself in a position with no good options. Um, and I think, I mean, to just sort of meander off the question for a moment, I think that's part of the power of the book on a dramatic level is is that you feel so intensely that these people who um, the average citizen would think are very privileged, exist in places of great power um, and have a lot of ability to change things really find themselves helpless. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I think- And by the way, that is so realistic. I can assure you, I, I had six, tours of duty in the Pentagon, one in State Department, and one of the NSC staff. And good people trying hard, and yet big doors can swing on very small hinges. Someone's child care falls through, the right briefer isn't available, a briefing goes badly, a decision turns wrong. It, I've seen it again and again and again. And in the novel, there are moments where you're, you should be just screaming at the characters pull the keys out of the car. You can still stop this. Uh, and yet they don't. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, uh, so Angus, uh, I, I'm intrigued with your, uh, describe, you often describe as two worlds you've lived in, the world of neuroscience and the brain up close, and then the movement to uh, literature and its role. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we often think of the brain as sort of uh, neuron snapping. You could get almost down to a kind of mechanical view of the brain, but clearly it's a whole lot richer than that for some reason. And then you, and your feeling is you can tap into certain things. I'm curious, what is going on in the brain and what, what makes these devices that you write about in your book, Wonder Works, right? Wonder, uh, what makes these work? Why, why does this resonate? Well, uh, first of all, much like the future, the brain is a mystery. Uh, and that's why I think it's such an enticing object of study and why it produces so many great stories. But a few things we can say about the brain just to kind of get us started off. The brain is not a computer. Uh, you know, I started out my career uh, in a science lab when that's what we thought. And that was pretty much what most researchers thought. Most researchers thought at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s that the brain was basically a computer and that it ran on logic and that when it made a mistake, it was because emotion was interfering with the way that the brain worked. Um, but in fact, that's actually not the case because the enormous power of the human brain is actually creativity, not logic. Human brains are not very logical, even at the best of times. We have uh, a very um, limited ability to, to onboard data. Um, most of us tend to fix on one or two pieces of data and then just tell everything around those one or two pieces of data, usually to fit our own emotional biases. So the human brain is not logical, um, but it can be extraordinarily creative. 
And that's why the human brain is the most powerful thing on the planet is because when you have a human brain, you can, uh, in response to any obstacle, come up with an unprecedented solution. And in response to any opportunity, um, come up with an unprecedented future. You can leverage small things into huge gains because of imagination. And that's ultimately the reason that I think stories are so powerful. Um, it's not just because stories are effective modes of communication. They can be. But it's primarily because they actually are uh, the operating system of the brain. And so if you can get a good story out there, then you can join other people into that story. So to take, again, uh, the example of the, uh, the, the Admiral's uh, novel, what that does is that invites us into a narrative, that invites us into a story, it invites us into a hypothetical universe. And then the moment we're in there, we start to inhabit this experimental space where we start to say, well, what if? What if they had pulled the keys out of a car? Or what if they turn the car left or turn the car right? Or what if this had happened instead? And then once that starts to engage, you start to have one reader, then two readers, then a thousand readers, then a million readers, all this participating in the same story thinking experiment. And out of that comes creativity. And out of that comes more options. And that to me ultimately is the definition of leadership is to expand the capacity of options in the people around you to increase flexibility in organizations and growth in institutions. So that's what, the, that's what neuroscience tells us about story and the brain and why the, the two of them uh, go together because they're sort of each other's best friends. Can I bounce off that quickly um, and mention another novel to make a point, which is that the story that perhaps captivated you or passed right by you when you're 14 years old, you suddenly re-encounter it when you're 54 years old. And it's an entirely different story. Um, and it's entirely different impact. And this happened to me recently in rereading a novel everyone read when they were 14 years old, To Kill a Mockingbird. Do you think maybe that's about America today? It's about racial inequality a flawed judicial system, a flawed policing system. It's a young woman's coming of age. It's about integrity in high office. It's a remarkable book that I didn't appreciate when I was 14. And, and so I brought obviously a lot of experience in life to the book the second time around. That's one lesson. Rewatch movies, re-read books, particularly novels. But my question, Angus, is, does the brain age in ways that are germane to this conversation? It does, and it can. I think, um, so without being, without flattering you, you are an unusually successful person. And, and in general, unusually successful people have one common trait, which is perspective taking. It's the ability to get outside of their initial perspective and inhabit other perspectives. Not necessarily to take on those perspectives, but to understand them, yeah. to think through them, to, to sort of anticipate them. And so what happens is with some people as they age is that ability um, produces more uh, perspective, uh, more wisdom, uh, more humility in oneself, because the more you get outside yourself, the more you see other perspectives, the more you realize the limits of your own perspective. So all these things take over in, in, that, in that kind of positive version of the brain. But not everyone's brain ages that way. Some people, typically through fear and other uh, mechanisms, actually start to retrench in their own original perspective, mm -hmm. and they shut down, um, and that makes them less able to inhabit outside views. And so what happens is, is that's a sign of growth. If you're someone who, uh, like me, when you were young, did not like your parents' music, and did not like the books you were being assigned in school, and then as you got older, you realize, hey, you know, maybe my parents knew more than I thought, and maybe my teachers knew more than I thought, and, you know, maybe there's this huge reservoir out there in life. You know, that's a positive sign that maybe you're starting to un unstick a little bit. Um, but if you're the kind of person who's just always reading the same books over and over and over and over and over again, yeah. um, and never developing a new sense of what those books are or new emotional range, I mean, that's a sign that you might want to try and widen. That's well said. So, uh, a, a question for you. Uh, I've watched a lot of the panels today and people continue to say and propound what I view as good, fair, future-looking ideas, yet uh, changing the world 
seems to be hard. We've got almost a division going on in the world between the two two kind of worlds you described, Angus, kind of open to and ready to accept the new future and kind of retrenching into a what we might call nostalgic past, but they don't. They view it as a pretty serious past. Uh, what's a, as a leader, I think you're stuck between one hand being sort of clear about what ought to be said, clear about what ought to be done, and yet in trying to encourage this inquisitiveness, this learning, this openness. Uh, and I know, I know, Jim, you as an admiral thought a lot about this, and you've written a lot about this. Angus, you're with the Army now helping them think about creativity. Let's talk a little bit about this tension in leadership. And then I have a second piece of it, but first, this tension. How do you handle this tension? I'd actually like to hear Karen's reaction to it. Um, you know, I've spent a lifetime grappling with that question, and I could give you a couple of different answers. But um, Karen, you're so engaged in in creating these alternative worlds, if you if you will. Um, what, what's your reaction to Jerry's question? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think that it is my rough take on it is that it sort of also points to two different ideas of leadership, right? Is leadership um, getting people to execute the idea that you already have in your mind, Mm -hmm. but you just don't have the time to do yourself? Or is leadership like um, bringing a group along to discover something or achieve something that no one person in that group could have even imagined by themselves. Um, I think that, I mean, I can only speak about uh, this phenomenon in the creative world, but the, in my observation, the people who are most successful um, creating movies that people resonate to are people who have a strong idea of their, what they want to say with the story, what they want to achieve, but they're not dogmatic about how they achieve it. And they're open to having their mind changed. So I think that the, uh, this tension exists because you do have, like at every level you have people who are sort of on their own path of how do I feel about um, what's my opinion on the best way to accomplish this task? And because it exists not just at the very top, but also in middle management. And even like the moment that someone is in charge of someone else, that is, you you know what I'm saying, right? There, and these, I think that people are very sensitive to not the, not, quite as much the spoken messages, but how do things play out in their everyday life? Um, And I think that's part of, we had been talking a little bit earlier about um, values and how you say values and how you, um, versus how you express them. And I think that part of what makes um, the values that are expressed in movies sticky in people's minds is that they're not said they are, you learn them as a byproduct of being with these characters in these situations. So, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna, I was gonna just mention that just tying together a point that you made and a point that uh, Angus just made. um, And it's the idea of changing your mind that leaders um, are, are open to that, are open to uh, stepping out, getting another perspective, and then changing their mind. I, I think that's an underrated function in leadership is this idea that, whoops, wait a minute, we really are going in the wrong direction here. Um, I just read an interesting book in this regard uh, called Think Again by Adam Grant, who I think is a pretty good writer and thinker. And uh it, it it really unpackages that idea of changing your mind. So I and I think it ties back to what Angus was saying about the sign of a a first class mind. Yeah, I mean that is real strength of character to be able to change your mind in public. 
to be able to do that in public, to have that confidence in yourself, say I was wrong and not to be afraid of that and to know that you're going to live beyond that. And, you know, talking about story and the value of story, just in terms of our panel, that is one of the real values of story because that can give you as an individual a sense that it's not about me, it's about the larger narrative. It's about the larger, I'm a character in a larger narrative. And when you have that in your mind, then all of a sudden it empowers you to change because even though you're changing the story, your part of is not. That's actually growing and developing. Um, and, you know, this also goes just to, I think, one of the ways that we can empower other people to change and other people to grow through story. Um, when you tell someone what to do or when you present them with a plan and you say you should do this, if we could scan that person's brain, what we would see is that we were forcing them to make a decision. And that decision is, do I agree or do I disagree? And that's a very kind of risky zero sum situation for you to put someone in. Uh, however, if you were to say to them, let me tell you this story. Let me tell you the story about the future. Uh, then what you're doing is you're not forcing them to make a decision. You're actually activating an entirely different set of circuits, which are perspective taking circuits. And also uh, to Karen's point, action circuits. To engage them through activity. And then they start to imagine themselves in that world. They have this sense of freedom and liberty and possibility. Um, and that empowers them to join the narrative. And that's also why stories aren't just powerful for us as individuals to help us get out of ourselves, but also to help us engage other people by presenting them with a narrative. That gives them an opportunity to engage and empower themselves as opposed to forcing them to make a choice with me or against me. Well, you're the Shakespearean scholar, but boy, uh, can you pull so many different characters out of Shakespeare's plays uh, on both sides, right? The the heroic Henry V, the band of brothers, but the overwhelming ambition that uh, entraps Macbeth, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so many uh, powerful stories from Shakespeare, I think, in that regard. Yeah, and you know, what's amazing about Shakespeare is his ability to take us on with all of them. Exactly. And I think that shows both the capacity story, but also our capacity ourselves. I mean, um, I mean, again, I think what I admire about uh, your novel, Admiral, and what I admire obviously about Pixar's movies is the ability for us to have empathy for characters who are different from us. Yeah. And I think if we were to just watch Shakespeare and say, oh, Macbeth is evil, bad, you know, I'm done with him. Richard III is bad, done with him. Cleopatra, evil, done with her. But instead, we go into their minds, we understand why they make the choices that they do, and we grow with them through understanding those choices um, and grow ourselves. And that only builds empathy and curiosity and, and all these other other um, powers of our mind, but it allows us to live multiple lives Yes, and become richer selves. No, I, I have felt forever that the real power of reading is exactly that. It allows you to live an innumerable additional set of lives and every book can be a simulator. You can put yourself in there and say, would I make the choice that Atticus Finch made in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird? Or, or would it be Macbeth. Um, and uh, it's just that to me, that's a big part of story. And to Karen's point, uh, the word sticky, what stays with you? It's, it's, it's a character, a story with real complexity in it. I, I couldn't agree with uh, both of you more. To make explicit a connection that uh, Angus just sort of referred to obliquely, I, I think that story is a it's an easy and it's a fun, desirable way to perspective take. Mm -hmm. Like we are not, it's very difficult to do it in our personal lives because we're so like stuck in, we're, we're just weighed down by the experiences and like all the details that we know about why we did this thing and that thing and blah, 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 blah. But story is a very, it's a way of doing that we, will sort of run towards because it's so entertaining and it, delightful and it lifts us out of ourselves. And so it's um, encouraging us to, I think, do this work that Angus points out is so important to making better decisions, under, having a better understanding of the world. Can I ask you just a fan question, which, you know, you've been involved with dozens of Pixar movies. What, what two or three characters really stand out for you? that you're particularly, they're, they're, they're the sticky ones for you? Oh, uh, 
That is really hard. Um, I'll take an example from Ratatouille because it was the first movie that I started working on with Pixar. And that is, if, for those who haven't seen it, it's, about, it's a movie about um, a rat who wants to become a world-class chef in Paris. Um, and to me, like it's, it's done, there's so many on a craft level, there's so many things that are going on that are so smart and you're just like, oh my gosh, these people are amazing. Um, and I was watching it happen and I still can't like understand how they did it. Um, but I think that one of the most interesting character turns is at the very end when Ronan Ego, who's the sort of, uh, who's the antagonist figure in the film, finally eats Remy's food. Um, so Remy is the rat who wants to be a chef. Yeah. And so the, the whole time he's been held up as the person who, if I could get him to taste my food and he could recognize it as good, then that would be like an, that would be a marker that the world accepted me and it meant something. Um, but not to spoil the story too much, Ronan Ego has an emotional, an unexpected emotional experience. And the end of the movie is actually a monologue where he reflects on his own work and how the struggles and the efforts of this um, rat has caused him to think differently about um, what he does and what the value of that work can be. Um, and I think that, first of all, the writing is absolutely top notch but i think the thing that sort of causes it to just linger in your mind is i think everyone can identify with that capsizing moment where you initially feel disorientation like what just happened and then you realize oh my gosh that has caused me to understand my life differently and those experience those human experiences that we have are so, they feel so singular. They seem to come out of nowhere. And I think that we really long to feel like other people have had this sort of thing happen to them too. Mm -hmm. It allows us to say like, oh, this is real. It wasn't just some sort of like dream that I went through, but like this is, it, I mean, for lack of a better word, this is a thing. And other people have had this happen to them. That means that in the same way that I can understand new things about myself, I can discover new things about other people. Other people can become new to me, even if I've um, known them for many, many years. And I think that, that being able to discover new things about the people who are important to us is one of the things that makes life so meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So, so I guess, stories, I think, just distill those moments yeah. and help us see them very vividly. So I'm, let me, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. And two things to the people that are listening, if there's a way you want to pose a question, uh, do that. And I'll try to weave it into our discussion. But here, here's what I want to set up as maybe the uh, what I'm beginning to feel from this, this discussion. One is... Uh, we have this 980 people who are speaking today, all of whom I put in towards the class of leaders. They, uh, in their area, they're trying to shape an idea, take people forward. But then you have 7 billion people on the earth who aren't paying attention to what's going on today with us. Uh, and there's this tension between, I want to be a leader, shape the values of the world, and this 7 billion people trying to figure out what to make of where things are headed, because it doesn't, it's not easy right now. Work seems to be changing, climate's changing. There's a lot going on that's not satisfying. So where's the role of, uh, especially the media industry, uh, not only filmmaking, writing as the Admiral's done, television, uh, in helping those 7 billion feel where the direction should head. There's, there's a lot of filmmaking, which is entertaining. There's a lot that even gets at personal development, but there isn't a lot casting. What's the future? Uh, what should the future be made up of? So 
comments on that? I mean, does the film industry feel concern for that, those issues? Uh, am I asking Angus and Karen, especially that I think the Admiral wrote the book because he cares about these issues. So, uh, first Angus and you, Karen, and then, then Jim and I can conclude this and, well, first of all, yeah, the film industry does care tremendously about this, but I think we also have to understand that the culture of the film industry is very scary for many creatives inside it. There's not a lot of career, uh, career stability. Um, and so, you know, even though many, many writers and directors go in with these kinds of broader public intentions, um, a lot of them are, are scared for their jobs. And um, you only have to, you know, read from the outside to see that there can very easily be a culture in a lot of these places of fear um, and vulnerability that makes a lot of um, creatives, uh, you know, not necessarily do their best work and, and, you know, and feel scared. So I think that, you know, they need help and they need support. Like we all need help and support. And, you know, the broad thing that I would say in terms of leadership, um, just as a simple thing is humans are primarily emotional. We often like to think otherwise, but it's just not the case. Humans are primarily emotional. And whenever we talk about the future, the future has always been uncertain. I mean, it's no more uncertain now than it was 100 years ago, <laughs> 1,000 years ago. And you can go to almost any period of recorded human history, and people thought the apocalypse was not. Yeah. Uh, so this, even the sort of intense fear that we're having now, it does not strike me as being intrinsically different from when we thought that, uh, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States were going to obliterate the earth. I mean, we, we've gone through this in recent human memory with climate change and the rest of it. So I think that what you want, if you're a leader, is you want to say, okay, the future is uncertain. Humans are primarily emotional. How do I deal with those two factors? And I think the answer is that that can either be used to create fear or hope. And you create fear simply by saying the uncertain is dangerous. And you create hope by saying the uncertain is an opportunity. And I think that's the first and most basic thing that any leader can do is they can frame change, uncertainty, which are inevitable, as a chance for positive outcomes and uncertain hope. That would be kind of my main kind of contribution. Karen? I think that change, like, <laughs> one thing that I'm coming to realize as I get older is that change really only happens one person at a time. And I think that, um, as a society, we struggle with ways of trying to find um, methods to change a lot of people at once. And it's appealing to think of stories as like a mechanism to do that. And I think that it is true in that it increases, like you can speak to more people at once, but the story needs to exist in a human context. So, like the story, and by that I mean, a story can have valuable effect across a large group of people if it's one person really saying what they think to a lot of people. But I think that um, methods of storytelling that don't, that see it as a shortcut in some way, <laughs> Um, often don't have the desired effect because like when you, it's the way um, I imagine uh, the two of you, uh, gentlemen who have been in the armed forces understand, like you can give an instruction in a short way <laughs> and people don't necessarily follow it. Like sometimes you have to really put thought into how you give an instruction or how you ask your reports to do something and it's only that way that you get the outcome that you're looking for. And I think that what that says to me is that the stories are not just like a shortcut way to say something to a large group of people, but the people who are telling the stories need to really put the work in beforehand. Think about like, not what am I trying to get these people to do, but how do I see the world? What do I value? What do I think is important? What are the, what's the, as Angus would say, what's the future that I want to move towards? And I think that is 
much more effective because it respects that people don't aren't necessarily going to see the future in the same way. But if you can move forward with a sense of um, shared values and shared purpose, then that's 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 a different thing. That's where I think that you really get the incredible effects going. Admiral, the closing words for you. Uh, I'm One sure- thing we haven't touched on, um, which is a story, is the way the media portrays current events. Um, CNN mm-hmm. is a story. It's a story that goes on and on and on and ripples into the future. You know, one of the worst things about dying, in addition to leaving all the people you love and never having a good ribeye steak again, um, one of the worst things is you don't know how the stories come out. You yeah. don't know if Donald Trump's going to run again in 2024. I'm dying to know how that story's going to come out. Uh, you don't know, is Kim Jong-un going to do a nuclear test? Um, are we going to see Iran come back into the deal? Um, will Meghan Markle have another baby? Will, they, <laughs> will Harry reconcile with the royal family? These are the important issues of our time, and uh, or not. And the point is, that's a story. And uh, it ought to be grounded in truth, but it isn't always. And that gets us to the social networks and social media. I mean, there's layer upon layer of this that ripples out because the means to move these stories at scale is beyond comprehension at this point. And um, that's, I think, a, a longer and more fulsome conversation. I'll close with a quote from Napoleon. I always love to quote Napoleon because, as Jerry knows, um, I'm five feet, five inches tall. I'm not that towering admiral out of central casting. And uh, so I love to quote Napoleon because short people have to stick together at all times. <laughs> Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope, not in fear. A leader is a dealer in hope. That's the best kind of leader to be. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure being on with everybody, Jerry. Thank you. And thank you, Karen. And thank you, Angus. Yeah. Thank you. to all. It's a great discussion. I hope they've recorded it so others can watch it. By the way, we, we ended up at, at seven viewers, so I think we may have topped the charts. So <laughs> we're, we're on our way to something really big. So this is a great discussion, really important issues. And I keep thinking about how to multiply this uh, conversation out into the world because we're at a point where just words alone I don't think are sufficient. We need these stories to really carry us into the next uh, decade we're going into. So thank you for your time and thanks everybody. Bye bye. Zoom wave. See you yeah. later. <laughs> See y'all.